We do welcome you all. My name's Jeffrey Little. I'm the Sergeant at Arms, and I'm sometimes the the MC. But uh, got a back seat today. I'd like to hand you all over now to uh, our incoming uh, president, uh, David. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Jeff, and welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's meeting. Um, can I begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation? and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I anticipate we will have a lot to say about land today. Um, can I also thank those of you who have been good enough to make some contributions uh, when you registered for today's meeting. Can I also acknowledge President Mark Dyer, who is having a well-deserved rest from chairing these meetings. Mark, please sit back and enjoy. Um, special welcomes to our guest speaker, Annika Molesworth. We also have visiting Rotarians with us today, Hank Dole, welcome, and Bronwyn Wade Lewin. Uh, a couple of other guests, um, Nicholas Sadu, I see that you're here, welcome, uh, and Emma Mitchell uh, is here as well. So welcome to our happy little home. Um, as far as the agenda for today, it's gonna to go a little bit like this. Uh, I'm going to make a few announcements about things that are happening in the club. I'll tell you about some upcoming talks. Then we're gonna have plenty of time to hear from Annika. Uh, we'll have uh, some time for Q&A. Um, but first, you can't have a Rotary Club meeting without a thought of the day. So um, we've asked uh, Glenn Stafford, to enlighten us with whatever it is that he's been thinking about. Over to you, Glenn, for a thought of the day, please. Thank you very much, David. Well, given our uh, uh, speaker today and the topic, I thought it'd be very good to cast our thoughts in the direction of our rural and farming communities, who yet again are doing it tough across major parts of the country. If it's not drought, it's fires or it's floods. Uh, this cannot seem to get a good run. With that in mind, with our thoughts in that direction, I'd like to just remind people that the Rotary Club of Sydney supports the Barren, but Barren Buttock Hay Runners. We do some administration work for them. And what I'd like to do is just ask those attending today to think about turning their thoughts into action. As we think about the farmers, we think about rural communities, go to the Barren Buttock Hay Runners website and make a donation. We help to manage the finances for them, and they'd be truly welcome. We may not be in drought, but the farming community are still suffering out there. So that's the thought for today. Thank you very much. Glenn, who you just heard from, has taken up a new role as our relationship champion with PCYC. So thank you so much, Glenn, for being our club liaison to um, PCYC going forward. So, um, let me now introduce to you our guest speaker. Um, Annika Molesworth is a farmer, a scientist, storyteller, and she lives and works on Wilyakali land, which is uh, what we would know as far west New South Wales. She lives out in the Broken Hill area where I think her family has a property. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to Annika when she spoke at the Climate and Peace Forum back in August. Now, you should know that the Climate and Peace Forum is an initiative of Rotary, and specifically the Rotary Clubs uh, of the Sydney area. Uh, and DG Jeremy Wright uh, is instrumental in putting that together. Well, I had the pleasure of hearing uh, Annika speak, and I thought to myself, my goodness, uh, she would be a terrific person to come and speak to the club. Um, just us, <clears throat> and uh, here she is. So that's wonderful. Annika is the author of a book called Our Sunburnt Country. A young farmer shares how we can grow the courage to protect our land and save our food. Annika is the founding director of Farmers for Climate Action, a national network of over 5,000 Australian farmers undertaking climate change action. Annika was awarded the uh, Young Farmer of the Year, a recognized as Young Farmer of the Year in 2015. Uh, she's done many other things, including in 2017, she presented at the TEDx Youth Sydney Forum on the subject, farmers are the key to a better future. 
Um, lots of good quotes from, uh, from Annika already, um, but here's one that I particularly liked. The biggest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else is going to save it. Uh, I also know that Annika has a few things to say about the Nationalist Party, and I'm rather keen to see what she has to say about that. Um, if you have questions, and I hope you do, please send your questions to me um, in the chat box, and I will curate the questions um, when we're done. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Annika. Annika, the floor is yours. You have plenty of time. Please, please enlighten us frighten us and make us make us work. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for inviting me to be a guest speaker with you all today. Um, I'm such a great admirer for of Rotary and for the work that you all do. So thank you for having me share this this moment in time with you. I'm going to present a few slides uh, this afternoon and I'm just going to share my screen now. So we'll get them up. So I hope you can see those slides now. And if there are any issues during the presentation, just call out so I can stop and we'll, we'll pause and get them working. Um, but yes, my name is yeah, Anika Molesworth and I am a farmer, a scientist and a storyteller. And I would firstly like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands where I live and work, the Willyakali people. And I recognize their continuing connection to land, water, plants, animals, and culture. And over 60,000 years of living alongside the Australian landscape, telling their stories, both of heartache and of hope. Now I've called my um, presentation today, Cultivating Climate Courage, because I do believe we are living in a time where we need to grow courage to confront and overcome the challenges we face to find ways to tell our stories in a way that is honest and authentic, but also inspires hope and action. So my family and my home are located in the ruby red sands and sapphire blue skies of Willakali land. And it is a place where you could walk all day and not see another person, but you would see a lot of kangaroos, wedge-tailed eagles gliding above, and tiny dainty wildflowers that form carpets at your feet after rain. And I grew up here with my brothers going horse riding and camping. And I learned a lot about respecting the land and having pride in growing food, food that goes to feed and nourish people. And as a child, I was in awe of this landscape. I was caught in its magic. And my life of possibilities seemed as endless as the horizons here. For me, family and home is about food. It's the meals my parents, my brothers and partners sit around the table enjoying, the fresh produce that we eat as we talk about our lives. Food connects me to my home because my home also produces that food, not only for my family, but for people all around the country. And what a privilege it is to be able to do that, to be a food producer, to live and work alongside nature. And whenever I was asked, what do you want to be when you're older? I was very quick to respond. I want to be a farmer. I want to produce food for people. I want to live and work alongside the natural world. So you might imagine my heartache when I started to question whether that was indeed actually possible, because the land that I fell in love with as a child started to change around me. Now, this is my home in 2019, when the drought was gripping hard and the dust storms were a weekly occurrence. Extreme heat, droughts and dust storms like this one are becoming more frequent and more intense my home is changing. The landscape that I fell in love with as a child is being damaged and species that I used to marvel at are disappearing. And I decided living through these experiences that I could not continue to stand on the sideline as a silent witness 
watching the people and the place that I care about suffer. And so this became my driver. This is why I refuse to accept the future that is being handed to us with the climate crisis. This was the start of my story, but it definitely is not the end of it. And it was living through this drought that made me aware of how connected people are to nature. Because drought is like a thief. First, it steals your rain. Then it steals the feed and water for your livestock. So you have to get rid of your animals. And that means no more farm income. Then the drought started stealing people around me because people move away when the drought takes their jobs. And people's mental health got worse, feeling worried and depressed. But the drought doesn't only affect farmers or people living in rural communities. It affects everyone, every meal on every plate, actually. Climate change results in food availability going down, food prices going up, and the nutritional value of food also being reduced. And as I became more engaged and worried about climate change, I began to ask myself, well, what can I do? And so I started studying science to try and understand the impacts as well as the solutions. And I became very aware of the big challenges that this world faces, the pressures that we are putting upon our earth by a rapidly growing global population. By this time tomorrow, there will be nearly a quarter of a million new mouths to feed. Now, if that wasn't concerning enough, we are currently losing productive land. Arable land, pastures and forests are disappearing and at a rate that far outpaces the Earth's ability to restore and replenish these areas. There is also a global trend of rural to urban migration and a widening gap a disconnect between those people living in cities and the farmers who actually feed and clothe them. Our world is not the same as past generations. The world our parents and grandparents grew up in is no longer, and we here now need to realize that and use that knowledge to act. Now, this is a map of global temperatures. And you'll see as the visual tracks over the last 135 years that global temperatures are becoming hotter, which are shown with yellow, orange, and red. And you will also see an acceleratory effect that these changes start happening at a faster rate. Now, here we are in the 1930s when my grandparents were born. Moving into the 1940s now. Moving into the 1950s when my parents were born, the 1960s, the 70s. Here we are in the 1980s. This is when I'm born, 1990s. Anyone with teenage children or grandchildren, they're born around here. And for anyone with grandkids or toddlers, this is the world that they've entered in. Year after year, season after season, records are smashed in high temperatures and low rainfall. And anyone under the age of 43, we have never experienced a year of global average temperatures or below. So the question I ask myself is how are farmers going to deal with this? How are we going to feed a hungry world with this kind of climate change? Climate change is not a concern for the future or for the other side of the world. It is a concern right now, right here. Our world is changing and we here today bear a responsibility to change, to adapt, to do something different, more appropriate for this moment in history. We live in a hungrier world where population growth is driving food demand. We live in a wealthier world where there is a new middle income class increasing consumption. We have changing customers who are choosier, information empowered with expectations of health, provenance and ethics 
and this disconnection between rural and urban communities. But we have new technologies that are changing the way that food can be produced, transported, manufactured and consumed. But we are in for a bumpier ride with social, economic and environmental change reshaping our world and the farming systems. And it is this bumpier ride that I became interested in. If I am going to have a future on my family's farm, if I'm going to have a chance to produce food for people, then I need to work out how to help solve this problem. And I want to work alongside people who are trying to help solve it as well. Because if we don't do this, who will? The good news is we actually know what's causing the problems. And these are the biggest sources of greenhouse gases which are causing climate destabilization. It includes transportation, industrial and manufacturing processes, it includes the way that we are producing food and fibers. And it also includes the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. The recognition of the science and what we're experience, experiencing can sometimes feel overwhelming and daunting. Is this all that it can be? But can we use our wealth of information, the wealth of evidence out there to actually change the system? Do we have the courage to change it? And when I look around the farming sector and the rural community, I actually see so many reasons to be hopeful. So there are so many ways that we can reduce emissions from the farming sector through many technologies and practices. And I'm going to pull up a few words on the, the slide here, but it is because we have so many options at hand that I do this. We have ways to reduce methane from livestock through feed supplements and selective breeding. We can reforest degraded land and thereby capture carbon in plants and soils and increase biodiversity. We can electrify our homes, our communities, the transport system. And as an electric vehicle owner myself, I can tell you EVs do not ruin weekends and they are actually perfectly suitable for rural environments. We can also improve land management with better fertilizer use and fire management. There are so many practices and technologies that are being deployed today by farmers, which help cut out our greenhouse gas emissions. And when we consider technologies and practices under research, one can't help but feel excited. And again, my apologies for all the words on the slide, but I want to make a point that if someone says we don't have solutions or we don't know what to do, I say rubbish. We have an abundance of solutions right at our fingertips. And everywhere I turn in rural Australia, I see ordinary people doing extraordinary things. People who have the courage to change the way that we live alongside the planet. People who are changing the story and helping to shape the legacy that we will leave. And I'm sure when you cast your eye across your community, you also see great change occurring. People championing a better way of living. And they are not doing it for reward or title or recognition. They do it because they believe that we could do something better and that we should do something better. But the rate and the scale of the climate crisis means that we need to do more than what we are currently doing. We must amplify and expand our solutions. So the question we arrive at now is how do we use our wisdom and skills to change the system? How do we move from individual activity to collective impact? And there are many ways that we can drive this change. And I'm just going to touch on three here. We need to grow the number of people who are educated, engaged and feel empowered. We need to bring policy in line with the science. 
and we need to change the way that we tell the story. So touching on the first point of helping more people feel educated, engaged and empowered, we need people to be aware of the science, aware of what it tells us. We shouldn't dismiss it or downplay it as challenging as it can be, but we need to actually step up, own our accountability and believe that we can and we should do something with it. And this includes engaging with a diversity of people from different ages, regions, socioeconomic backgrounds. This photo is from a program I'm involved with called the Young Farming Champions, in which I zoom into schools around the nation and speak with the next generation of food consumers and producers. And these students ask the best questions. They are creative and critical thinkers, and that's what we need. I'm also one of the founding directors of Farmers for Climate Action, an inclusive movement of farmers and rural Australians who are leading the way on climate solutions. And our theory of change is that if we can organize farmers to advocate together, then we can positively influence our sector and the government to implement climate policies that reduce pollution and benefit rural communities. And I really do encourage you to look up Farmers for Climate Action on the web or follow them on social media because they are such an inspiring group of rural Australians. And finally, we need to change the way we tell the story. We must bring the humanity back inside the climate conversation. And we need to talk about our challenges with all the fear, the concern, the worries, the hope, the excitement, the vision. Yes, it does feel easier to sit this one out. Yes, it would be easier to stay quiet and not speak up, but we actually don't have time for that. We need to act in a way that is not only equal to, but greater than the rate and the scale of the challenges at hand. And telling our stories is important to do this. So we need to com communicate climate change in a way that is local, personal and urgent. We need to tell stories from the heart. We need to push ourselves so our voices are heard and heard by people who are inadequately engaged and inadequately responding. And that does mean stepping out of our comfort zones and having the courage to talk with dissimilar thinkers and doers. Now, I personally love nothing more than being alone in a paddock with my dog and an endless horizon. I love the quiet and the solitude and speaking up and being visible really does push me out of my comfort zone. It does not come naturally to me at all and every presentation fills me with nerves. But I do this because I care. I care so much about my home, my family, my farming community. And these things are standing in a path of danger due to climate change. And we're running out of time. So we have to get on top of this problem and communicating this issue is what we need. So with all this knowledge and understanding, the question is now, how do we use it? How do we move from a place of awareness to action? And do we have the courage to change the system? Acknowledging that our greatest challenge ever faces us now is not done lightly, but that's where courage comes into it. And the word courage comes from the French word cœur, meaning heart. And in its earliest forms, to be courageous was to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. So I am here as a young farmer from a remote arid farm telling my story and that of farmers around the world and bearing all in an effort to address the greatest challenge that we have ever faced. Climate change brings us an opportunity to reimagine our interaction with the world, to step up, to do things differently, to do things better. And now it is the time to use our wisdom and our skills to act. So what is climate courage. Climate courage is having 
the mental and moral strength to withstand the fear and difficulty met when we confront the climate challenge and still choosing to act, knowing something better is possible. So thank you all for having me along to speak with you today and I welcome any questions. May I ask a question, please? Just a sec, um, Jeff. What? We'll, we'll, we'll get to you in a moment, Jeff. Thank you so much, Annika. That was um, in, inspiring and um, uh, confronting uh, just the way you wanted it to be. <laughs> uh, we do have a number of questions, which I'm going to um, put to you, uh, if I may. Let me just find these. Um, and there are quite a few. Um, let me just begin with this one. When you look at the key elements to ensure that we have available farmland, access to water is obviously a key issue. What are one or two recommendations that you can um, share with us to ensure that we have water security? Yeah, water security is a very big one, especially here in Australia, as we're the driest inhabited continent on Earth. And it is becoming drier in many parts of the country. And I think since 2000, the Murray-Darling Basin has received around 40% less inflows. So it's changing very quickly. And farmers being on the front lines of this are very much well aware of it. So in terms of how to improve water security, well, we can have crops that uh, use less water. So there's research being done for more drought tolerant crops. Also the, the infrastructure, uh, instead of, I guess, flood irrigating a field, one could use drip irrigation technologies to make sure the water is getting exactly where it's needed to the root zone of the plant. So you actually get more crop per drop, so to speak. And this just, uh, again, goes to highlight why there is such a need for investment in research and extension too. So we actually understand how do we grow more water, um, you know, to drought tolerant crops? How do we be more uh, water secure as farmers? How do we roll out these technologies and practices? And how do we make sure that farmers are well informed of what changes are happening and what different practices they can implement? Um, Annika, just a follow-up on the water issue. My understanding is that um, cotton farming is very water intensive. Can you explain what the difficulties are that are facing cotton farmers? And is, it, is there, will technology assist in, in, in them, you know, for them? Or um, what, what is the big problem with cotton and water? Yeah, sure. So uh, cotton, um, it does use a lot of water, but so do a lot of other crops too. Uh, cotton is generally flood irrigated. So you see the field with a lot of water in it, um, you know, irrigated through the furrows. So again, drip irrigation technologies might be uh, a solution there to reduce water wastage and the evaporation that comes when you have, you know, that mass uh, uh, flood irrigation or furrow irrigation but again it's also looking at um, the research you know how do we actually produce more uh, drought tolerant uh, cotton crops cotton plants so they actually require less water for us because we do need cotton to actually wear for our clothing and natural fibers are a lot better than synthetic fibers which we most commonly see in the shops um, and that's a whole different conversation of, you know, fashion and the wastage and the resources that go into producing synthetic materials. Um, so we need to not demonize certain farmers, but actually encourage them to be, you know, the best land managers and use the best practices absolutely available. Great. Um, just talking about your own um farming practices on, on that very arid piece of land that we've seen those lovely pictures of. We have a question from John Ross. What changes in farming practice have you instituted in recent times um, in response to climate change? Yeah, so historically the property, you know, past uh, owners were running European sheep breeds. And when we purchased the farm, 
Over 20 years ago, we introduced an African sheep breed, the Dorpas and Damaras, which are much more drought tolerant. Um, but we've been in drought for five, going on six years now, and we've destocked the property. So we're no longer running livestock or you know, having that grazing pressure on the vegetation. So that's very important that we are adaptive and flexible to the seasonal conditions. We've identified a number of rare and threatened species on our farm. So we've established conservation reserves to make sure that they, uh, we don't lose numbers and we actually encourage the regeneration of these species. We're involved in numerous uh, citizen science projects. So recording you know, the diversities and species of frogs, for instance. So we are regularly updating the Australian Museum with what frog species we have. Um, as well as you know, plant species. We have we run completely on renewable energies, which is great that um, we have the solar panels on the homestead roof. So our home and businesses is using sunlight and then we plug in our electric car and we run off that. So there's many things that we're doing to uh, adapt to reduce our emission. And then we're also very much involved in looking forward, you know, what citizen science projects we can be involved with. Oh, great. Um, um, a related question to that, uh, Annika, is, is this. Um, and, and I guess I can preface this by saying that um, our government, um, for which probably the less said the better, um, has this view that science is going to save us. Um, and surely science has an important role to play in this. Um, but behavior change is, is, is important too, for the reasons that you've mentioned. But are there any specific agricultural technology innovations that you're particularly excited about that you can share with us? Yeah, so yeah, the, as you say, the government is very much focused on tech solutions, um, which sometimes overlooks the more common sense solutions of keeping trees standing and planting more vegetation, which seems like the no brainer. So we absolutely need to be doing that. We need to be preventing carbon being released into the atmosphere from you know, land clearing, especially of high carbon landscapes like primary forests and peatlands and things like this. And then obviously we need to be drawing that carbon back into the, the, where it belongs, the soils and vegetation through vegetation and tree plantings. But going back to your question in terms of what you know, exciting innovations and in tech is actually out there, uh, one of them that I find really interesting is how we can reduce methane emissions from livestock. So ruminants, sheep, cattle, goats, they produce methane, uh, which they burp out. And methane is quite a, a damaging greenhouse gas. It has about 30 uh, times the warming potential of carbon dioxide, although it has a, a shorter life when it's actually in the atmosphere. Uh, but feeding... Uh, ruminants certain feeds can actually change the gut microbiome and so less methane is released and one of that uh, solutions is the the feed supplement of algae and it's a very specific algae which it, if it's mixed into the feed it can reduce methane by up to 90 percent um, there's also you know great research being done in selective breeding so you know, every animal is different, is unique, and some of them will naturally produce less methane. They have a different microbiome setup. And so if we can understand the genetics of our livestock better, we can make sure that our herds are producing less methane. That's fascinating. Okay, moving from, from animals to, to plants, um, vegetation clearance by farmers um, is a major issue. Um, what can be done, do you think, to rebalance vegetation management from too much clearing to more revegetation? And, and what sort of vegetation do you think um, needs to be um, promoted or planted um, to, to better achieve that sort of outcome? So the, the, the question really deals with the land clearing versus revegetation. Yeah, and when we stumble across a problem or identify a problem, I think it's very important to ask why, and then why again, and why, and why, and work it all the way back to what's actually driving this problem. 
So yes, we have land clearing done in Australia and we're one of the, the worst uh, developed countries in terms of deforestation, which is not a great title to have. Um, but why are farmers removing this vegetation? Are they financially strained and needing to actually clear more land to have a viable productive business? And this is a big area of conversation that needs to happen in Australia because as consumers, we are so often encouraged uh, to buy the cheapest food and to think that the cheapest food is the best food. And we see advertisements on TV arriving in flyers in our mailbox saying prices down, 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 you know, come to our shop and buy the possible, the, the cheapest food possible. Now, how is a farmer actually supposed to manage land properly, look after their water resources when they're barely breaking even? And that's when you actually see poor land, land management practices come about. That's when you actually see livestock being run during a drought because a farmer has their back against the wall in terms of having to pay back you know, loans and such. Uh, that's when you do see land being cleared. So I do think it is a conversation for all of us to have because we are all very much intertwined in the food system. And when we go and make our purchases in the supermarket or the shops, am I actually selecting something that has been produced by an Australian farmer? Am I supporting the local rural community? Am I paying a fair price for that food, which is actually fairly compensating that farmer so that they can do the best on their property, so that they can keep those trees standing and not feel financially strained, that they can adopt new practices or technologies or equipments to help them in this changing climate. So I think there are some really big conversations that we as a, an Australian society need to have about how we are treating the food system and what we are actually asking of it. All right. Um, well, certainly the issue of, of, of the, the pressure of the consumer, I can well understand is, is an, uh, a big problem for the farmers for the reasons that you've explained. But there, there's a question that I thought I'd want to bowl up to you. Uh, understanding as we must that um, academics have been involved in agriculture forever. There are always people at universities telling other people what to do. Um, agricultural academics, um, how are they responding to climate change? And do you find that, that farmers are being taught differently now than they were in the past? Well, for instance, Farmers for Climate Action, this is one of our goals to actually bridge that divide between what's happening in research and academia and the people who are actually on the land growing our food and fiber. And so we've been running webinars and in-person sessions, bringing leading researchers out to the regions to present, you know, these are the changes that are occurring in terms of reduced rainfall or hotter temperatures. These are the projections going forward 10, 20, 50 years time in your region. Um, and also a chance for those researchers to listen to the people who are managing the landscapes, to hear the anecdotal stories of what's changing, what's disappearing, what's emerging, and to use that on ground understanding to incorporate back into the science. So there has to be a multi-directional flow of information between researchers and farmers, and also to the policymakers. So this plays into the comment that you made about you're having to talk to people that you previously wouldn't have been talking to. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, there's a number of questions um, here that are sort of hovering around the climate change skeptic uh, the national party, um, the attitude of the government, the dragging the chain approach to Australia. Um, can you just, what are your overall thoughts? Let me put it to you this way. Why do you think with all of this science and all of this intelligence, there is still resistance to the, even the idea of climate change or to the urgency of it? Where is this resistance coming from, do you think? Ah. Uh... Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. It's one that I often <laughs> ask myself. Um, so yes, in federal 
Australian politics, there are some vocal, but you know, they are the minority who are really dragging the chain in terms of climate action, um, who are dangerously dismissing the science and downplaying the urgency. I mean, we've only recently had the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, come out uh, two months ago or so and say, this is code red for humanity. Like we have had decades worth of evidence saying that this is a real problem, it's getting worse. And we are at this critical point in time that we have to do something because that window of opportunity is just open and we've got to do what we can right now. And I think we are, are seeing, you know, this growing voice from rural Australia and from farmers in particular saying, those people in Australian federal politics who claim to be representing farmers and who are dismissing climate change are no longer representing us. And we look at Farmers for Climate Action, we have six and a half thousand members who are championing, who are talking to the media, who are saying that I'm doing something on my property, I'm doing as much as I can, but we need more research, we need more investment, we need better policies that give us guidance and direction and actually change this very dangerous trajectory that we are on. And we need to absolutely keep on doing that to lift our voices and to band together and to make sure those who claim to be representing us are actually striving to put in place the best most ambitious climate policy is possible um, because that's what we absolutely need right now. Um, just a couple more questions, if I may, Anika. Um, one of the problems, I suppose, with a world that is flooded with information, even flooded with science, is that people can pick and choose the science that they want to, uh, uh, that, that they want to believe in. Um, what do you make of people who have arguments like, well, there's always been natural fl fluctuation in the climate and, uh, you know, there's an alteration of the axis of the earth, um, you know, and, and, and the magnetic poles and, and, and these kinds of, you know, arguments, if they are arguments, are being thrown up to explain the problem. What, 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 what do you make of that and what can be said to people who have subscribed to those views? So we absolutely have a naturally variable climate, especially here in Australia. I think we have the most um, variable natural climate in the world, but that also makes us the most, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate disruption. For me personally, if people are, you know, adamantly against understanding the science um, and refuse whatever evidence is presented to them, I personally don't have time for those people and I consider those people very dangerous. They are dangerous to my future, to my farming community, to my home. So that's why it is so important that we do share good information. We share it in a way that is engaging, which is honest, which is truthful, that we don't dismiss or diminish it. Um, and we do encourage the majority of the population, and it is the majority of the population who want greater climate action, to understand, well, what can they do as individuals and communities? Because I do feel like we are at a social tipping point where more people than ever before are engaged on these issues. They're wanting to do something about it. Um, and if we can just, you know, light a bit of a spark and get those people understanding and doing something about it, I think we will see change happen in the right direction very quickly. Okay, thank you, Anika. Um, look, there are contrarians in every group. Um, and I have a question here, which has sort of been put to me, um, not so much in terms of detail, but, um, and I think that uh, now, now, Jeff, are you around to put the question the way you want to, because this will be the last question we're gonna have time for. Um, Jeff, are you around to put your question about consumer pressure? You're talking to me or the oh, other? Sorry, oh, Jeff, Jeff Wilbo, sorry, Jeff sorry. Wilbo. Uh, look, I just wanted to raise the issue of, um, we, we talk about consumer pressure. Um, most of the people on this call could well say, oh, well, I'm prepared to pay a bit more for food because it will go. But the issue with consumer pressure, of course, is for those people who are on the margins. Um, who often don't have the choice. And it's the whole thing that I think to solve this problem, we need to take collective responsibility. It's a bit like 
the Brazilians shouldn't cut down their forests. Well, the world's got to take a responsibility for support of those people. And it, 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 it's easy for us to say, oh, I'll buy an electric car, I'll buy, I'll buy more expensive food to support a farmer. But that's not the answer. There has to be collective, and in the end, I'll, I'll probably be accused of being socialist, but there needs to be government regulation and control because it's the people who are themselves under pressure, people having trouble feeding their families. You can say to those people as much as you like, stop buying cheap food. But, you know, it's, so I'm just, so I, I mean, thank you for your presentation. I'm not challenging it at all. I'm just saying as a community, as a society, both locally and globally, we need to start, um, we, we need to do this as a collective um, to support our farmers and, and support the, the climate change. I couldn't agree with you more, Jeff. And the way I think of it is everyone has their individual circle of influence, things that they can change. Um, and what you can do is different from what I can do. I can't actually catch public transport, but it is a good option for people living in the cities. But I do have the financial privilege to buy an electric car. And so that's a step I can take. And not everyone or no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And as you so rightly state, we need to absolutely be looking out for the most vulnerable people out there, people who do not have the luxury of finance or, you know, labor to help with their farm or they have small, you know, subsistence size land holdings. We need to be looking after the most vulnerable in our communities and around the world um, and realizing the responsibility that we have, um, you know, having that privilege to do more to actually help solve this problem. Thank you, Annika. That was a, a, a lovely answer to a complex question. We can't do everything, but we can always do, we can all do something. Uh, I think that's a message that we can, uh, we can all take home with us. Um, uh, that, uh, that's although there were some other questions, we're really um, conscious of the time. So I'm going to ask um, Karen Lobley, uh, another one of the architects of our um, climate action group and the founder of our climate action group at the um, uh, here at the Rotary Club of Sydney, to uh, uh, offer a vote of thanks to you, Annika, for your wonderful presentation. Um, Karen. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Annika, and thanks, David. Um, I, um, so I changed what I was going to say because, as you say, that we can all do something. I've got a little sign up here, which actually comes from the Social Summit, uh, Social Goods Summit logo, and it's it's got one person can only do so much, but then they cross out the only, so that it reads one person can do so much, um, and I think that's very appropriate. Um, um, I, I also took from your talk that about, um, you know, buying locally grown, locally produced um, uh, produce and goods and things and, and uh, being, um, being the partner of a fanatically Italian eater. I mean, he's not Italian at all, but he loves his Italian food. And I can hardly find a processed tomato um, jar of, you know, chopped tomatoes or passata or even pasta sauces that are Australian. The, the, the tomatoes and the ingredients, I've started reading the back of every jar available. So it's a real struggle. And, and they're the things that we could do a lot better, I think. Um, but thank you so much for talking to us today. I think we've taken a lot away. Um, I'm glad you've spoken to the uh, large number of our club members. Um, and I'm hoping if they have a lot of more questions to come to our climate group talks, come to our meetings, and um, you can ask either the lay person like me who's read like crazy all about climate change or Thelma who is much more scientifically versed in it all. Um, for information um, for to thank you for your talk today we will make a donation to give every child a future which is our centenary project to vaccinate hundreds of thousands of children in the south pacific so thank you very much Annika. thank you for coming
That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and let me just do a just a quick wrap up before we close the meeting, uh, other than to thank you, of course, Anika, for that lovely presentation. I'm so glad you're, you're able to give us as much of your time. Um, but I also want to acknowledge and thank Thelma Rahman, who is the uh, chair of the Climate Action Group, uh, who would otherwise have hosted today, but had some other obligations. But uh, we couldn't have had this meeting without uh, Thelma's um, input. And of course, the assistance of Kathy Tate and Karen Lovelay, uh, without whom very little happens. Um, thank you also to Jeff Little, our uh, Sergeant at Arms, for that introduction. I'll call on you in a moment, Jeff, to say um, to, to close the meeting. Thanks also to Adrienne Luzano for the technical expertise to make today run as smoothly as it obviously has done. Uh, to Glenn Stafford for the uh, thought of the day, giving us some encouragement and reminder that we should support uh, the, uh, the Hay Runners. Karen, thank you for that eloquent um, note of thanks. Um, and uh, everybody else who's worked behind the scenes to make today's um, talk um, as successful as it has been. And of course, thank you to all of you for taking the time to attend our Rotary Talks meeting for today.